Investing beyond the U.S. Uh, or international investing, some might call it. I'm Eric Beagleisen. I work in research at 3 Edge Asset Management. We manage a little under $2 billion in globally diversified, tactical, quantitative-driven portfolios. But we do a bit of investing uh, internationally. So I think I can be at least conversant. But thankfully, I'm joined here by my esteemed colleagues here. Uh, who are much more expertise in the in the space, and just to make sure I get all the titles right, uh, Patricia Ribeiro, co-chief investment officer, global growth equity, senior vice president, senior portfolio manager uh, for American Century Investments, strong history of Latin American equity research, and over 20 years of industry experience. Uh, Jason Sue is the founder and chairman of Radiant Global Advisors. Worked with Rob Arnott on Rafi Fundamentally Weighted Indices, has published numerous articles, a uh, general thought leader in the space, so really happy to have them here. But before I let them talk, uh, I'd like to hear myself talk a little bit more, uh, as I do. And uh, if we can get these slides going here, uh, let's just set the stage a little bit on, on, on the topic we're going to talk about. This chart right here, I think a lot of us have seen this. This is uh, the S&P 500 in blue. Uh, MSCI Europe in, in orange, MSCI EM in, in gray. And this is from the, the depths of the global financial crisis in February 2009. Uh, you, we've all experienced this. This has been the U.S. has dominated everything for, for so long, 14 years now. Uh, be, certainly being a diversified money manager has made it challenging to add value when the only thing that, that works is U.S. equity. Uh, and so you might say, well, shouldn't that continue on? Uh, why, why are we even discussing international if the place is U.S.? And so this is, this is really a chart I want to focus in on. Uh, what we're looking at here are price-to-sales ratios as a, as a valuation measure for, for U.S. equity market. Now, this is 150 years of monthly price-to-sales ratios lined up in a spreadsheet and adjacent to them. And that, in the next column over is the 10-year forward return. Then you take deciles. You rank sort these price to sales ratios, take the average for each decile, and you plot them here. And what do we see? Inverse relationship. The lower the price to sales ratio, the higher your average expected return over the next 10 years. What's really interesting is way over on the far right, December 2021, peak of the stock market here in the US, we had a 3.2 price to sales ratio, pretty high. Even today, at the end of August, we were at 2.5, still like on the north side of that 10th decile. Uh, what's interesting is when you look back over that 150 years, there were five periods when the price to sales ratio in the U.S. was over two and a quarter, say, for an extended period of time. One was in the 1890s, as I'm sure you all remember, uh, during the railroad tech stock, or not tech stock, the railroad, the railroad stock bubble, uh, then following the Spanish flu pandemic in 1920. Then again in 1929, just before the, uh, the peak of the market there and the, what, the, the ultimate crash into the Great Depression. Uh, the tech stock bubble in 99, and now again, here we are, uh, post-pandemic, uh, 2022, 2023, we're seeing that same behavior. And each time of those five times, well, not the, not the fifth one just yet, but we've seen substantial drawdowns following these excessive overvaluation periods. So maybe that's a reason not to be so focused on, on the U.S. This is another way to look at uh, something similar, but the relative valuation of emerging market equities versus U.S. equities, you can see it's at its multi-decade low. Uh, right near uh, the, the bottom, touching, you know, not saying it can't go lower, but how much lower can it really possibly go, really, right? Uh, this is another way to look at it. Now, these are uh, estimated earnings growth for 2024. You've got uh, emerging market Asia leading the pack, followed by broad EM, and then the U.S. and developed market. So that's, that's bolstering well, perhaps, for, for emerging market equities. I'm sure we'll talk about that. And then finally, you know, just broadly speaking, looking at three-year rolling windows here of U.S. versus, say, MSCI EFA, and just, you know, looking at the outperformance or underperformance of one versus the other. And we're so used to the, the more recent, the right-hand side of that chart, uh, where U.S. is dominated. But if you go back over the decades, there were decade-long periods where, where international outperformed, and it flip-flops back in time. And you can see this, this more recent run has gone on, maybe not with as, as much outperformance as we've seen in the past, but certainly longevity-wise, this is a much longer cycle. So... Just trying to paint a picture here that says perhaps, not necessarily, I'm not going to give a, a crystal ball, but perhaps uh, we're due for, uh, you know, a change. Um, so, so with that said, uh, we're going to cover a few different geographies. 
Uh, we're going we're gonna to have some general questions about international investing, get some audience questions. We'll finish up with a little lightning round uh, if we have time. But let me, let me have the panelists give a brief introduction on themselves, a little bit how the, their firm philosophy, how your firm thinks about international investing broadly. Patricia? Okay. All right. Um, so good morning. Uh, Patricia Ribeiro. I work with American Central Investments. I am on the active management side of the firm, so more specifically focus on international and growth side of the business. Um, as I mentioned, we are actively um, managed fund, very bottom up, so um, really focus on emerging markets as well as international overall. It's great. Jason? Hi, I'm Jason. So first of all, thank you for staying till the last day of the conference and coming to the last talk for the conference. Otherwise, we're going to be very lonely up here. Uh, but uh, Rayleigh Global Advisors, uh, we are a quantitative active asset manager focusing especially on emerging markets. And I would say within with emerging markets, we focus especially on emerging Asia growth. Uh, if you know me at all, you probably know me from you know, research affiliates and Rob Arnott and Fundamental Index, like Eric mentioned. Uh, so you know we, we love quantitative investing, we love markets that are inherently inefficient because in those markets values and growth factors and quality factors work phenomenally well, even better than in the U.S. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is why we're out in that region hunting for alpha and really we love the beta too. Excellent, excellent. So, so let's kick this off. This is going to be somewhat broad, but what countries and, and what sectors maybe uh, in these countries should investors be looking for for the remainder of this year and maybe going into 2024? Hmm. Yes. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are very bottom up. So we really approach the countries really looking for where we find our best ideas, looking for earnings growth, acceleration in earnings. Uh, identifying companies at the very early stages of that inflection and then acceleration. So we really look broadly across. We start by thinking every country, there are opportunities across every country. And of course, of, over different periods of time, you might focus on one versus another. So when it comes to emerging markets specifically, we really finding opportunities across emerging markets. If you think about regions, we find it in Asia, we are, regardless of what is happening in, in different countries, uh, we find them in Latin America and also Middle East, right, and, and even South Africa. So for us, it's more about what's driving the growth, what's driving that acceleration. There is always pockets that you can find within different countries. For example, even a country where, you know, we'll be talking more about China, but China where we're seeing on the macro side there is being deceleration for a period of time, we're still finding opportunities there, areas where the consumer is spending. For example, the consumer is traveling since the opening up post-COVID. Um, so, you know, sectors like, you know, hotels, entertainment are areas that are doing well. They're not spending much in terms of the consumer discretionary side, but, you know, they're spending in other areas. Gaming, you know, gambling is, is very big there as well. Uh, internet, there is still opportunities there. So this is China specifically. And then if you move to other parts of emerging markets, uh, Latin America, we are seeing uh, more opportunities on the consumer side. Why? Because there, um, the governments have actually been very proactive and started actually raising interest rates with the, so, the whole challenge on, on uh, um, uh, CPI, on inflation. They started uh, raising rates pretty quickly, way ahead of the Fed. So now they're at that stage where it's flattening out and even starting to reduce interest rates. Obviously very good for consumption, in that case, companies that tend to be more levered, um, that SME space is also very relevant when we're starting to see interest rates coming down. Um, Middle East, for very different reasons there, there is much more about the program that they have, the 2030 focus from Saudi Arabia, for example, where they are really investing in opening up the country and attracting tourism into uh, into Saudi, Saudi Arabia. So that is creating also a tremendous amount of opportunities to invest in companies that haven't really been growing as much for the longest time because it was a very closed country. But with that opening up and attracting tourism into the country, there are obviously many opportunities there. And I, you know, I can't go on and on, but clearly 
Um, there are opportunities in the emerging markets, and I think just to finish the valuation is very attractive. As you all know, we're going through sort of really challenging times globally, and that's being carried into emerging markets, risk off and all of that. But, but when you really look from a bottom up, there is a tremendous amount of opportunities at very, very attractive valuations. That's great. That's great, Jason. So, um, you know, being a more quantitative uh, asset manager, I think about value plus momentum. Basically, you want to buy something cheap, but you want to make sure that sentiment is starting to go in your direction so you're not waiting forever. So, like my two country picks, uh, I'm going to start off with China being the obvious one. Patricia talked about that. This is deep value, right? We're talking about maximal fear. If you believe in the Warren Buffett saying of buy when there's fear, um, you know, again, it's not 100% and cheap can get cheaper but this looks like a deep value play. And you know China's not going anywhere, and I'm sure we can talk a lot more about that later. Uh, the other country pick that I like is Japan. Again, it's been a value play for a very long time. But the good thing is I think you're finally getting the momentum signal to flare up as well, right? Japan's been the best performing sector, and uh, this is sort of something cheap, starting to draw in capital, starting to get positive sentiment. So that catalyst is there. So we like that a lot. And of course, I would say just from an industry perspective, in China, we like the EV sector just because we kind of forecast the second coming of a you know, Japanese automotive industry happening in China with regard to EV. Right? They just crossed Japan and Germany as the biggest auto exporter. Right now, they go to, they're, they're exporting to Europe, to LATAM. Not in the US yet, but that's how Toyota got started too, so don't underestimate that. That's great. That's great. So let's, you know, it wouldn't be international uh, panel here without really focusing in on China. So let's let's dig in a little bit there. What's what's the outlook there? Is it is it the next Japan? Some people are calling for that. Any any thoughts? Yeah. So let me start then. Um, yes, you're right. So China is obviously a big focus, not only for emerging markets but globally, right? It's relevant to all of us these days. Um, we are not expecting China this time around to come up with massive incentives. As you all know, the economy there has been decelerating. We have seen some measures you know, from the government, but very, um, I would say, timid or very, not very large in terms of really creating a massive impact across the whole economy. And I don't think we're going to see it this time around. And the reason why is because if you all remember after the, the crisis of await, the financial crisis, uh, China was actually the, the country leading sort of that growth again uh, in you know 2009 and 10, and they were very aggressive in investing and putting a lot of money in infrastructure. And what we saw years after, sort of for several years, is that they had a massive challenge with actually inflation, and they had to really put the brakes on the economy and really bring it down quite a bit. And that was a very sort of difficult, it's difficult for businesses to manage companies, corporates, into that sort of, you know, seesaw kind of macro environment. So I don't expect them to be really aggressive and into massive stimulus in the economy. What we're trying, or we're seeing that they're trying to do is really deal with parts of the economy that have been more challenging. For example, the real estate market has been a challenge. It's relevant for the economy, has created some issues for them in terms of uh, liquidity and, and, um, and the debt level of some of these companies had raised over the years. So I th what I expect to see is exactly that, is they, I would say, tweak the economy in a way that it's going to manage it, but not really be aggressive on that growth. And more recently, more I'm talking about the last month or so, a uh, couple of months, we're starting to see some of the data out of China telling us that it's starting to plateau, but at a very low level. And I guess the question is when are we really start to see uh, corporate earnings really improving going forward. And that is still not that clear. I think there's still more measures from the government that we're going to be seeing, but nothing massive like we've seen back after the financial crisis. That would be my expectation. So I'm going to disagree with Patricia slightly, <laughs> but only on sort of short-term policy stuff. Uh, you know, my guess is we're probably in the part of news cycle and policy cycle in China where the government is starting to feel the heat, right? This is the first year of Xi Jinping's third term. People are expecting great things. I think, I think he was advertising you can expect great things once I consolidate power. So I think there's a lot of pressure for him to deliver, and given how bad things have gone, 
uh, I think that pressure is only intensified. And he's trying, like Patricia says, he's trying many more measured things because he does want to avoid inflation and inflation-driven housing bubble. But I think his hands may be forced where he's going to try the, you know, tried and true, print lots of money, worry about it later. So that's kind of my bet. <laughs> but that's worked well in the U.S., right? It's worked well yeah. everywhere, right? I would say longer run, if you want to think about China growth, um, I, I only look at one indicator, right? Where is China's per capita GDP relative to Japan? Right? Japan really plateaued once it hit about 40,000. You saw the same thing for Taiwan and South Korea, right? Taiwan just hit the Japanese level. South Korea is not far behind. And you kind of see once you get there, right? that's the gold standard in terms of productivity, it gets harder. China is at 13,000. India's you know, probably half of it, about 7,000. Those are two economies, I think. There's just a lot more headroom to grow. There are going to be short-term obstacles. But when you are that much cheaper and you got fairly comparable productivity that continues to increase, there's just a lot of room for you to keep imitating, learning, catching up. Now, you know, along the lines of the stimulus, it seems like maybe there's some disagreement here, but... You know, from February of 2021, maybe that was the, roughly the, the timing of China's peak, and they've been kind of on this decline, at least the equity market, for some period of time. Uh, and more recently, we've just seen these drips and drabs of trying to aid the, the sector. Oh, less money down or interest rate help. And now we're seeing the property sector hurting as well. Uh, you know, are we going to see a bazooka? Again, I, I, so what we saw in 2021, right, second half of 2021, was really regulation in China. If you remember, it was the government coming, really coming down really hard on many of the large companies there, internet and education, and we can go on and on, in, inclu including real estate. And that's what actually scared investors, and certainly international investors, they were they were kind of, they didn't understand what that was really the approach obviously it's kind of much more hands on controlling corporates and that's not something that investors like to see and then the economy came later on right it's really 2020, uh, 2022 again i don't see that they are going to come back but but you know we were just talking about this earlier what we saw if you remember with covid recently right early this year until earlier this year, very late last year, it was zero tolerance for COVID in China and everything was shut down. You know, uh, the population was not allowed to really move freely and that turned overnight. And, and you know, what happened there? What, what is it that triggered the government to all of a sudden open up the economy, you know, in, in overnight? Um, so we could see, you know, something happening that would be great, as you said, globally for everybody, because obviously Europe also is hurting from challenges there with China. So it would be perfect. I, at this point, I don't see that yet. I, what I see, again, is the government being very measured and targeting sectors that are relevant for the economy, trying to manage consumption. I don't see the government wanting the economy to be growing at the seven, eight, ten percent that we have seen uh, since the financial after the financial crisis, and and can they measure? Can they manage that five percent, five and a half percent that they talk about? That certainly it's not going to happen this year, um, and that's that's the big question, right? But but what I do think is that we have we are plateauing at very low levels and at very attractive valuations. And if that is the case, I and mean, even if the government is tweaking it and managing, trying to sort of come back to that five and five and a half growth by the end of next year even, I think that's very positive for equity markets, in my opinion. So, Eric, I'm going to bet on the bazooka option. And, and the reason is, you know, Patricia is right. Like, the bazooka option has consequences, right? But... I think China has always been learning from the U.S., and they've seen the U.S. use the bazooka options many, many times without consequences. So they're going to go, you know, that's tried and true. But more importantly, like to Xi Jinping, everyone talking about how bad the market's performing, the economy and GDP, to him, uh, that's a distraction to his bigger play, right? He loved touring the world, you know, being one of the you know, great leaders you know, being up here to the U.S. He likes that. He doesn't want the distraction in the background. It's like, your economy's doing poorly. Stop you know, going out and doing foreign diplomacy. So I think he's going to try to get rid of that distraction by saying, use the bazooka, just get it done and over with. 
But he is a great, a big leader, a great leader, or, you know, whatever you want to say. He is, you know, second largest economy in the world. So he's going to get the attention anyway. The criticism, I'm not sure that he cares as much about the global criticism about what he's doing. I think what could drive him to be more aggressive in measures is actually the internal opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's what the Chinese population is thinking. And my, what I hear is that the population in China is not happy with him at this point. So that might trigger him to be more aggressive. I still don't think it's going to be a massive, but he can be more aggressive in trying to really come up with measures that will drive the economy to accelerate faster than what it obviously has been yeah, so Patricia, far. Patricia, I absolutely agree with you. Right? Like we've seen with COVID, you know, people being unhappy with current policy has been effective in forcing the hand or changing Beijing into a about face. In some ways, Beijing even celebrated. Look, you know, without having elections, we're very responsive to people. And, and I think they celebrate that message as well. So maybe this will happen again. That's great. So on the, still in China, but this can really apply to several emerging market countries probably, but state-owned enterprises. Uh, how should people be thinking about those? You're looking bottoms up. You like value and momentum. Uh, should people be considering state-owned enterprises? Do we trust them because you, they're backed by the state, or do you say stay away from them because they're backed by the state? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, it depends on the country, I think, and it depends on the sector that we're looking at. So if I think about China, just to finish here on China, I think the SOEs, are, we should definitely look at them, and that's because they are supported by the central government and even the, the local governments. And they tend to be the winners. When there is a, you know, a competition between different businesses, the government tends to always push to the side of the SOEs. The SOEs are also tend to be very well run, I think less risk, of um, you know, any kind of uh, um, instability in the management or even corruption. They tend to be pretty serious about that. They want the SOEs to be a, an example, for not only internally, but externally as well. So I think the SOEs in China, are, I feel much more comfortable investing in SOEs in China than I would feel in SOEs in Latin America, for example. There tends to be the other way. There tends to be very manipulative and trying to compensate for areas of the economy that are not doing well, but not in a very sort of a more business approach. It's about creating jobs. It's about um, lending at lower costs. It's about, it's, so it's not really about profitability at the, at, the, at the company. So it depends on the region. It depends on the country. Uh, and even the sector. But in general, we don't shy away from SOEs, but we are very aware of the country and the sector that they are in. Yeah, absolute agreement with Patricia. I mean, we spent a lot of time studying SOEs in China because they're 50% of the market cap. You almost can't avoid them. If you exclude them, you would have too little to invest in China. And when we look deeper, there are a few things that's actually very surprising, and Patricia is absolutely right in that they almost have like the A team running these companies. And the reason is because um, you know, the Chinese government is the biggest shareholder. So you can think of like from a corporate governance perspective, right? The biggest shareholder really, really pay attention to what management is doing. So if you had you know, poor earnings, poor earnings growth, you get removed. You know, it's not like here you got an entrenched management you can't get rid of there. You know, the state simply says, look, you're fired as CEO. You suck at your job, right? If you do a good job, uh, you get to move to a bigger SOE and eventually move into a senior minister position. So people really, really see this as like a test for future advancement, and they do a phenomenal job, like Patricia says. It's really, it's the A team running the state-owned enterprise. And then on top of that, you also have government insurance. Because it's viewed as such a face of the Communist Party, they can't let these companies fail. So if whether man-made or by nature, you know, some accident happens, the government fully backs it, floods it with liquidity and bails it out. Uh, and so you kind of have the downside insurance, kind of like our Fed put, and then you also have this really strong shareholders who's constantly breathing down the neck of management, and it works. That's great. And uh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to continue just nonstop China questions here, but one more here. Uh, Everything sounds hunky-dory in China. Uh, potential for a bazooka. You got state-owned enterprise. Can't miss opportunity. 
Uh, what about the geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and China, the CHIPS Act, uh, the, Apple, the new iPhone 15 is a security concern to China. Uh, what do we think there? What, what's happening? Talk, talk to me about that. All right, so uh, the, the risk of the relationship getting worse, it's absolutely there. Right? Uh, and you know, at the margin, the pain that U.S. can cause on China from you know, decoupling from China, asking for more French shoring, certainly that's going to create costs. And you know, China's going to do something to retaliate just to look strong, and that's going to make business worse. So that is all true, right? And no investor should go, oh, I'm going to wait for all of that to get better before I invest in China. The thing you want to think about as an investor is there's a risk, and it's in the headline all the time. Um, how much of that has been priced in? And how much of that is just too much unreasonable fear so you can earn a fear premium, right? There's risk. You want to earn that risk premium. But if there's sort of excess unreasonable fear, that's your alpha. That's the fear premium you want to capture. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't, I don't expect uh, anything massive out of the whole China, Taiwan at this point. If, you know, the government in China, if, if they were thinking about it after the whole situation with Russia, Ukraine, they clearly sort of stepped away from that. It's, it would be, it, frankly, it would be too much globally for everybody. So I don't, I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. Um, but I totally agree. I don't think, I think you should look at it. There is a lot of headlines. There is a lot that goes on. Uh, and some of it is valid, but a lot of it is just rumors and comments. And it's kind of each side playing their own book. So I think we need to be aware of that. When you look from, you know, internally from within China, I really don't see that risk being massive. And, and if anything, I think it's an opportunity here. And that's part of why valuations are so low. And people are sort of shying away from investing in China at this point. And, and I think it's an opportunity. It creates an opportunity for people that are really spending the time and, and really focusing on it. Okay. Okay. So, and if, if you know, because China's been beaten down, uh, struggling a bit, perhaps coming out of COVID here, not doing the bazooka just yet, maybe. Uh, how about Vietnam and other Southeast, you know, Southeast Asian economies? Can they do well if China's not doing well? Outlook there. So, uh, absolutely. I mean, long before U.S. is talking about French shoring, even the Chinese sort of businessman is saying, look, I can't be making T-shirts in China anymore, right? My labor force should be making iPhones, right? That's where I get margin. So they've been pushing a lot of lower end, low skill, unskilled manufacturing to the rest of Southeast Asia. Like Vietnam has been a big recipient of, of that kind of uh, bonus. Same thing with uh, Cambodia. And that will continue to happen, right? And a lot of people are complaining, oh, you know, China's too expensive to manufacture. Sure, China's too expensive to manufacture T-shirts, right? But you don't want to be manufacturing T-shirts for way too long. So the fact that China's moving up its per capita GDP, moving up its costs, is because they're making more valuable stuff. That's not a bad thing. Your cost is rising because the skill level is rising. They're making more expensive products. And that push of the lower cost manufacturing to the rest of Asia creates great opportunities, right? So if you're looking for who's going to be the next Taiwan, South Korea, um, definitely you want to look at Vietnam. You want to look at the other Southeast Asian manufacturing hubs within the EM basket. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. I think, um, I think that China has much bigger ambitions. They are not want to be you know, manufacturing cheap um, products. They want to be focused on things that will really bring a lot more value added to them as a country, the technology side. And we have seen a tremendous amount of development that they have brought over the last 10 years, actually. It's really impressive. Um, and, and it does create opportunity for other countries, not only in Asia, but all over the world. And we are seeing, for example, Mexico. Mexico is being a big beneficiary of onshoring. And we expect that to continue. Um, and within Asia, the Asia and other countries, they, are, they benefit from anything China because obviously the size of the economy. We see smaller countries where they see tourism going into those countries, investment in properties as well. So there is a lot that happens from the Chinese population is spending not only sort of the, the government or manufacturing focus, but in general. So there is a tremendous am amount of opportunity there for smaller countries to benefit for sure, but I would say globally, not only in Asia. Sure, great. Uh, let's move to India. Uh, Jason, you noted when we were uh, meeting earlier about how you know, India is the software superpower, 
uh, you know, can't necessarily supplant China as this manufacturing hub. Uh, it'd be like asking Microsoft to become Foxconn, right? Uh, so, you know, with questionably the largest population on the planet, rising GDP per capita, generally attractive growth recently. What do, what do we think about India? So I would say long run, I love India, right? As I mentioned, like the one indicator I always look at is per capita GDP. There's all the reason for India to keep upgrading its labor force. I know there, there's some issue with the caste system and so on and so forth, but that aside, right, there's just so much uh, that India has right and can get more right. But like in the short run, I think there's too much of a, oh, India will be the next China. It's going to take over and make iPhones, right? It's going to take over and make EVs. That, I think, is unrealistic, right? That just, you know, Elon Musk says, ideas is cheap. The hard part is manufacturing, right? And so to say India will all of a sudden become China is ludicrous. And I think there's a lot of price pop, you know, that ran up in, in India because they say, oh, if India's going to be the next China, right, then, then I better get in ahead of that. No, look for India to grow in the long run as a, you know, software super you know, superpower, you know, it's already proven to be such a, a, a powerful partner for global, you know, software development, and they'll continue to get better. You know, but don't look for India to replace China, right? They're, you know, like what Americans don't do, you know, we don't do manufacturing and we don't do some of the complicated coding and customer servicing, we outsource to China and India, and that's not gonna change. You know, we'll keep coming up with great ideas and outsource to people who will do some of the harder work. Uh, but they're not competing and trying to replace each other. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, um, so when we look at India, it's, you know, it's the largest democracy, but with that, it comes some other challenges as well for India. Uh, I also see that what we look for and we keep waiting is for a new round of capital expenditure in, China, in India. Um, uh, capacity utilization is being at a level for the, I'd say, last seven years. And that has not really changed because there's this up and downs in the economy. What we need to see is when really corporates start to really increasing um, capex and spending and, and, and building more capacity that is the time, I think, to really, really be bullish on India. As we started, you know, we, until we see that, what we see is a bit more of a cycles in India. Overall, I think there is a tremendous amount of opportunities there. We are seeing some companies investing more in India, Foxcom, for example. So there is, a, there is this hope that India will be able to absorb some of that manufacturing away from China. I do agree, I think that's a bit difficult to see today. I think the, the technology and even some of the bureaucracy that we see in India makes it more challenging for that to happen anytime soon. Longer term, I think it's very positive. Shorter term, it, it, there is still other challenges there that they need to address. Um, so CapEx, I think, sort of the new CapEx cycle in India would be something that will make us feel, okay, we, we can see a longer term now opportunity to invest there for longer periods of time. The other thing with India relative to other emerging markets is valuations. It's a very, very high valuation. It's very expensive. So you need, so when you look at India on the broad sort of context of emerging markets, and even with China, it's really difficult to argue that, you know, you see more opportunity in India today. I think some of performance has really been because investors are shying away from China shorter term, but, um, but so I'm not negative, but I think there is a lot of hype around India. I think we need to be a bit more moderate on that. Okay. How about, uh, how about Europe? Europe's been battling inflation. ECB has been aggressive, bringing it down. Maybe inflation's ticking back up there. Uh, a lot of challenges in Europe. What do, what do we think about Europe, whether developed or emerging? Yeah. Different, so developed in an emerging. So you're right. So we thought earlier this year that um, that Europe was going to uh, do better, and we saw that in the market actually. The first half of the year, it's given back quite a bit. Um, inflation is still a challenge there, so interest rates are not doesn't look like they're going to really relax anytime soon. So we're being more careful there. I think there's still opportunities there, like healthcare. There were areas within the, um, the, the, um, the European continent that we see opportunities. But being careful there, I think it's still, as long as we don't see you know, uh, uh, inflation sort of really 
flattening out and starting to roll over, and with that, uh, interest rates, it would be more challenging. And uh, China has also have an influence there as well, in Germany, for example. So we're seeing that carrying over uh, to Europe. So they have some issues there to deal with the second half of this year, I think. What do you think, Jason? Uh, I think uh, Europe is the ultimate value trap. It uh, doesn't matter how cheap it gets or how, how much it underperforms the U.S., uh, its growth rate is massively slower than the U.S. It is not an innovation center, so you don't expect the growth rate to change anytime soon. There's no history of it, um, not at least in the last 50 years. Uh, and right now, I think people are also a little optimistic just because, you know, we see the Ukraine conflict as sort of democracy must triumph over dictatorship. But the fact of the matter is it's going to last a lot longer and get a lot more expensive than I think people anticipate it to be. And so that, I don't think, is fully priced. And on top of that, you got what Patricia mentioned. Europe, unlike the U.S., has a much harder time containing inflation because a lot of their mortgages are floating rate mortgage. If they you know, raise rates, they're going to wipe out the household sector. So they can't really, uh, like our Fed, hike rate as aggressively as that's needed to control inflation. And so you got these two big risks, right? Ukraine, inflation that can't get managed, and inherently demographics issue and the lack of growth, it's a value trap. A real rock and a hard place scenario. Uh, okay, how about some thoughts on, on LATAM or the Middle East, wherever you want to, wherever you want to take it? Okay. <laughs> um, so I, we started talking earlier about Latin America. I do see opportunities there, as I mentioned, uh, Latin America has actually raised rates, dealt with inflation. Inflation is actually at a pretty, um, pretty um, low levels, relatively speaking, um, within what the central banks are targeting. Uh, Brazil, obviously a big beneficiary of that. Uh, uh, um, rates are still high, but the expectation is for them actually to really continue to uh, come down, and they should because inflation is under control there. So that creates obviously opportunities there the cons for the consumer, as I had mentioned before. Um, SME is also very important. We should be seeing actually the financial institution institutions opening up more in terms of the lending. So we should see that happening. So I think it, I'm positive. I think, um, and there is a government in place, and specifically in Brazil, that tends to be a bit more focused on the lower income part of the population. So that should also help some of that consu the consumption uh, there, the consumer is spending more. So I think it's, I think, and, and consumer confidence is actually picking up quite nicely as well, which is another good sign. So I think Brazil is, is, is a beneficiary of that. Mexico, as I mentioned before, onshore has been actually been incredibly helpful to the country. That should continue. Um, so I'm positive there as well with Mexico benefiting from that, but also internally they are also managing um, uh, the, uh, the economy well. There are elections coming up, but doesn't look like there is anything out of the ordinary on that front. Um, and the Middle East also, we're actually positive on the Middle East. We're seeing tremendous amount of opportunities there. As I mentioned, the opening up in Saudi Arabia has been incredibly positive for the stock market for corporates that, that are listed, um, a market that had been very, very closed with very little access from anyone outside of the, the domestic population there. Now, all of a sudden, we are seeing a tremendous transformation in the country from, from different angles even. So we are seeing that growing quite rapidly. Um, they are investing across the board, they're investing in you know, hotels and all kinds of areas of leisure, entertainment. Um, they are even investing in alternative sources of energy, which is pretty impressive as well. So there are, there are, there are a lot of uh, opportunities there. It is a market where there's not a lot of uh, uh, companies listed, but there is a, also a very large list of IPOs coming up. Companies that are so far have not been listed, but are coming up pretty soon. So positive on that and that market as well. Yeah, I would say historically, and that's kind of looking at data going back as far as we have data on these emerging market countries. I'm fairly negative historically on resource-oriented emerging economies. So that's a lot of LATAM. It's obviously a lot of the Middle East. And if you can extend that, you know, the frontier market, it's Africa. But my views are changing. And it's changing in part because we're talking about China, right? It's because China, right? I think of these, um, you know, 
resource-based EM economies as sort of a trust fund baby, right? You, you got large endowments and everyone wants a piece of that and you're getting bad advice, you're getting bad terms because you don't know any better, but it was easy money, right? It sort of just come out on the ground. But now there's competition, right? I think uh, finally you got China coming in and say, we want some of that resource. So there's, that's gonna pre provide a lot more stability for the value of the resource. It's also gonna get them better terms, right? You're now gonna have the Chinese come in and say, well, I know you love the Americans, you've been friends with them, they've sort of supported your prosperity and your regime, but Chinese come in and say, we can do the same thing. We'll build you roads, we'll build you airport, you want airport, you want factories? And so pe competition is good, right? If you think about Africa and LATM, right? The competition from China against the European powers or, or kind of the American interest, well, bad because competition makes prices higher, but it's, you know, it's bad for, for the incumbent, but it's great for the resource-based economy, right? They're finally getting fair terms, better terms, uh, and I think that can only help. Now, the it, question is, can GDP translate into corporate earnings? That we have to see. So, and then there was one more thing to add there, too, which is, I think, historically, some of these countries were much more sort of focused on, you know, mining and metals and, and oil, but that is changing, and that has changed quite a bit. Um, even the composition of a lot of those in markets in the, in the benchmark in these countries are very different. If you look back in the, you know, the 2000s and even before that, there was a lot of that commodity space. Not that anymore. Now you see a lot more of the consumer names. They see uh, financials, right? You see more of that growth technology. So there is a lot more of that in those countries. So the opportunities are there and the growth on those areas have been much, much more than actually the commodity and the more traditional areas. And not only Latin America, but also what we're seeing now in, in the Middle East. So it's changing, and, and it's actually countries acknowledging that they actually need to make changes in order to attract investments, and, and so that's positive. Great. Now let's talk about some implementation investing. So we, we, you guys have presented some great ideas for folks. How, how should people think about accessing these geographies, uh, index ETFs, active solutions, whether ETFs or mutual funds, separate accounts perhaps, single stock purchases? Uh, does it depend on the region? Does the size of the country and the number of listings, does maybe the liquidity is lower, maybe that people should be thinking more ETF fund, but for larger liquid, maybe maybe single stock. What, what are your thoughts there? How, sh how should folks be thinking about accessing? So I would definitely, first of all, go with the fund format because as individuals, uh, it'll be very hard for an individual to try to open an account to trade in India. It's nearly impossible. Or even South Korea, you know, a country that's fairly advanced uh, because, you know, it's just administratively difficult. So you want a professional fund company to do that for you and just buy shares in that fund. It's far easier. And the second piece is uh, clearly we're biased, right? Active managers, right? But there's a reason why we're active managers in those markets because they're very inefficient markets, right? They're not like the U.S., right? It's not like trying to outperform the S&P 500 in those markets. China's 85% retail. I mean, even Taiwan and Korea, who's been in the emerging market basket and fairly institutional, they're like 50, 60% retail traded. And retail, we know, is a big alpha reservoir, right? They get pulled into the hypes and bubbles. They miss out on um, patiently holding a great company. So that's an opportunity where, where great managers actively uh, can solve a lot of problems for you. Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree 100%. I think um, these parts of the world, one is the resources available to be able to actually identify the opportunities. Um, also, we talked about before SOEs. If you are just buying an ETF, you're buying the good SOEs and the not so good SOEs that tend sometimes to have big weights on the index. So if you're really looking for alpha, you need to be able to identify, you know, some countries. Do you want to be aligned with the government? Do you want to be really paying attention to regulations that can change very quickly? So if you just lump everything together, I think your opportunity to really, you know, be creating alpha gets diminished quite a bit. It might work in times of more volatility, but it, it tends to be short-lived. And so for me, if you need to really invest, if you want to invest in, in, in emerging markets or international, you need to be, be looking for active management that will be able to uh, have the resources and really be able to really from even a bottom up identify where are the areas of opportunities here and how much do I want to really be taking the risk and investing in others as well. 
And, and along these lines, so it sounds like you both, you both prescribe to active management. That's, this, is shot, this is a revelation right here. Yeah. Uh, how, how should folks think about uh, currency exposure? Uh, is that something that the active manager is going to decide whether to hedge or not to hedge? Do you want the exposure? Maybe you have a view, you like the equity, but you don't like the currency. How, how should folks be thinking about that? Mm. So for, for us, in, in bot, so we're very bottom up, as I mentioned before. So currencies will always play a role and be really discussed and we'll be, be very aware as we're really doing analysis, building models, financial models for the companies and the impact that, that it, you know, currency exposure could have in earnings, not only currently, but obviously looking forward. So we are much more of looking at currency from a bottom up. I think hedging currencies in emerging markets can be really difficult and expensive over certain periods of time. So we don't do that. For us, the risk is really from a bottom up, is having that awareness of where what role the currency plays on any stock that we decide to buy. So on the currency side, we know in sort of, you know, asset allocation, the ideal pair of assets is they're short-term negatively correlated, but long-term positively correlated, right? Uh, currency does exactly that for growth emerging markets. Why? Because they're export-oriented. So when currency is weaker, they export more. So short-term, currency weakens, the stock market performs well, you get diversification. But in the long run, Currency strengthens when the economy strengthens, which means the stock market has done well as well. So in the long run, currency and the market both actually appreciate. You've seen that for Taiwan, for Japan, for South Korea, right? As they emerge, as their per capita GDP gone from 10,000 to 40,000, their currency is also strengthened by 30%. And that's why we don't want to be hedged in emerging markets. We want to capture that. Great, great. All right, let's go to some questions uh, here. How do you measure political risk when approaching an investment in an EM company? Also, any thoughts on high inflation countries? Hmm. Okay. Um, so political, the political scenario, the geopolitics, always plays a role in emerging markets. Uh, I think we always need to be aware of it. But if we look historically, and I'm talking, you know, I've been investing in emerging markets for a long time, uh, since the early 90s. And if we move forward from back in those days, in those days, I think um, the politics plays a smaller role today in emerging markets versus what it used to. But I think that investors and markets tend to still be very skeptical about that. And um, so it is important to understand, for example, new elections coming, you know, where does the, the, the uh, potential candidates stand? What are their, their agenda? You know, how do we position the portfolio to benefit from where they want to focus on versus the other side? So we always need to be aware of it. But I would say that in general, a lot of the noise that we hear around politics that can put pressure in markets for pe short periods of time tend to be overdone. And, and again, it might create opportunities for us, but I think it's, it tends to be a lot of headline news, but not really anything that you can really longer term say it was, a benef it was beneficial or not. It's kind of, a, you need to be aware and examine and measure is that a risk that I want to take? And most of the time, I would say yes. I mean, absolutely. I mean, political risk is a real risk. So it's, but it's, the question is, is it priced in enough, right? For, for investors, you buy a stock, right? If it's not political risk, it's, you know, concentration risk in the, in the, in the iconic leader, like a Tesla with Elon Musk, right? Uh, so you just want to ask, is that fully priced in? And like Patricia says, because of the short-term headline fear, Oftentimes, political risk actually becomes a source of alpha for an active manager who can ignore a lot of the noise, a lot of the fear driven by just headline. So it causes market to get too afraid or sometimes too excited, and that's when you can add alpha. Right. Yeah, yeah I'm going to just hit this last one. I had other questions, but I, I really like this one. We've really just been focusing on equity. Uh, talk to us about this. The question is focused on emerging market debt, but uh, let's talk about debt investing outside the U.S. I'm on the equity side, so I'm going to give that over to you. So I, I'm going to I'm going to opine on this a little bit, uh, in the sense that uh, you got a minute. I got a minute. Okay. Uh, all markets as they emerge, so you got to first of all make sure you invest in the debt of the EM economies that's going to emerge. 
notice there are a lot of EM economies that never emerged. So those are outside of my scope. So I'm focused on economies where they have a possibility of merging. Once you emerge, what happens to all DM countries? Their interest rate go towards zero. Why? Because as you emerge, the government gets more and more in debt and needs to monetize and finance its debt expenditure. And so their only move is to force interest rate down through subsequent stimulus, uh, monetary easing, quantitative easing. So you know, bet on rates in China as it becomes more emerged to gradually trend down to zero. You know, same thing with Taiwan, Korea, and of course the Latin economies that are gaining stability, they'll pursue that route as well. So their bonds, once they start to show sign of emergence, great buys. Great. We have 10 seconds left. Uh, this is a one, one question lightning round. You got one investment for five years, set it and forget it. What is it? I will do China. I'm going to do China and specifically I'm going to do BYD. I think that's the next Toyota. <laughs> all right. There you go. And we're out of time. Thank you all. Thank you both. Very insightful.